Hi everybody, welcome to Dynamo Sword Channel. I'm David and today on Sword Re Reviews I will be reviewing the Windless Battlecry Line Culloden Basket Hilt Broadsword. Now this is an interesting sword. Not only is it a uh, you know, intricate hilt, basket hilt design sword, uh, but it's also from Windless's newer Battlecry line. Now if you're not familiar with the Battlecry line, a few unique features to them compared to standard windless models is as you can see the um, all blackened finish, uh, the blued finish, um, but as well these swords actually come sharp out of the box. Now windless normally doesn't have uh, pre-sharpened swords. A lot of that has to do with windless, uh, you know, their home country is India and in India there's an export law where you cannot uh, ship out blade sharpened blades. So normally if you get a sharpened windless sword, it's normally uh, done through their uh, vendor Museum Replicas Limited and they offer a in-house sharpening service for about $20 a sword. And you know kind of the downside to that is is that um, you do end up having to pay extra on top of the fact it does add uh, about a week to the shipping time so what's nice about these battle cry line swords is is that since they are uh, technically pre-sharpened by museum replicas before they're shipped out to either other vendors or even just uh, museum replicas themselves you do get that sharp sword and um, you know a little earlier the Scottish basket hilt broadsword is a unique sword it began seeing use in the late 16th century and um, it continued to use well into the middle of the 18th century. Uh, you know, basket hilts themselves are a style of intricate style hilt swords similar to the swept hilt rapier or the more shell cupped uh, small sword or even the swept hilt side sword that was a little earlier than both. Um, but what makes a basket hilt unique is simply its basket itself. It has a basket that encompasses the grip and gives full hand protection. Now, like with anything where you go and you kind of focus an emphasis on um, you know, one aspect, usually you lose a little bit from something else. And that's kind of the downside to a basket hilt is because you, know, you do get that full hand protection and just the whole defense of the blade um, with the basket. But at the same time, you do lose a lot of maneuverability that normally you would have with a more open guard or, or wider swept hilt um, type. So with basket hilts, you tend to see them more have, um, as you can see here, a double-edged blade. Now, the reason why this is called a broad sword isn't necessarily because it's broad, because as you can see, it's actually you know, not a very broad blade, especially compared to earlier uh, you know, medieval arming swords or long swords. But compared to at the time in that, you know, 17th century, you know, 18th century time period, when you look at the other swords that were more prominent at the time, you see, you know, the small sword or, you know, the uh, curved saber, military sword. And compared to those swords, yeah, you would consider this more broad. It was also a way to describe something that was double-edged. This specific sword is a replica based on a 7th century Highland type designed by the renowned craftsman Walter Allen of Sterling. Now, Walter Allen was pretty prominent at the time for designing basket hilt swords in both Highland and Lowland Scotland. Uh, you know, with his, he just had a lot of very intricate design to it. He added a lot to the functionality of it, but also just the aesthetics and design. Um, this, this sword itself is actually named after the Battle of Culloden. And the Battle of Culloden um, took place in 1746, and it was during, um, you know, during the uh, second major Scottish rebellion uh, from uh, British occupancy. Uh, technically, Scotland had already been inducted into uh, the British Union at the time, but at that time, uh, Scotland uh, was actually uh, at the head of the. Uh, you know, as far as the British monarchy um, having a Scottish king on the British throne. And after he was overthrown, um, 
his uh, descendants, uh, you know, were kind of the the Highland, especially the Highlanders, uh, started kind of an uprising for the Stuart family to get them back on the throne, and um, the Jacobite uprising, which was in um, support of uh, Prince Charles Stuart, um, you know, that, that's what was as we know as the Jacobite, uh, you know, party or Jacobite uprising. And so there was a lot of skirmishes, a lot of, uh, you know, fights with England. Uh, and during this time, Stuart Charles was actually over in France because um, he was exiled and, and kind of th kind of pushed out. And so during this battle, the Battle of Culloden was kind of the last, um, as you could say, kind of the last stand of the Jacobite uprising. Pretty much in that battle, it was kind of the final battle where, you know, they just... Uh, you know, the British infantry, the English infantry just completely, you know, kind of decimated them and just kind of, it just kind of killed that uprising and just, it just kind of quelled it. They also, um, you know, issued a few acts to actually kind of abolish the Highland clan system and that Highland style of life down to, um, you know, banning um, Highland um, national weapons, for example, the uh, the basket hilt or the dirk, which were you know unique and popular to the to the Scottish Highlander, and then also you see them actually abolish, as I mentioned, the clan system, but also the wear of kilt. So you couldn't actually wear a kilt; you could actually you know uh, break in the law to wear a kilt. So they were really pushing out, you know, the Highlanders. They did not want um, you know another rebellion, another uprising. So that was their way to do it. All right, let's look at the overall statistics of this sword. So the overall length of this sword is 41 and a quarter inches, and that's from tip to the uh, little uh, ting button here at the bottom. Uh, the weight is right at three pounds, and then its point of balance is right at about five inches from the hilt, as you can see here. Um, the center of percussion is about 21 inches, so about right here on the blade, and kind of hard to see on the vibrations due to the basket, kind of absorbing some of that, but yeah, about right there, so about 21 inches. And then um, the classification of the sword again would be, um, as far as its time period, a broad sword. The overall length of the blade is 33 inches, and its blade width at the hilt base is an inch and three quarters wide. Now, it does have a small, short, about half inch to three quarters of an inch ricasso at the base there. And then the total taper, um, it slowly tapers to about an inch and a quarter at the tip. Now, due to this sword's, you know, kind of cutting profile and cutting nature, it doesn't have a lot of profile taper. Uh, but it does still have that, you know, uh, kind of spade-shaped acute point. So it is good for thrusting, but again, just kind of was a more cut-focused blade. Uh, the blade is made of 1060 high-carbon steel, and it has a mirror polish, which again is blued to give it that nice blackened finish. Uh, the blade does have a fuller that goes from the hilt up to about three quarters length of the blade, and then the blade ends in a nice uh, diamond cross section. Now the blade type again, uh, this does post date the oak shot typology, but still since it is later period 17th century, you know, post Renaissance, it kind of has its own unique typology as just a broad sword that you would see a double-edged sword that you would see in that 17th, 18th century. Being an intricate hilt sword, the guard itself is very unique and again, you know, intricate. So it's gonna, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give some different stats to it. I'm gonna have to write them up a little different than I normally do on re-reviews because, you know, normally I review, uh, you know, middle-aged swords, you know, with you know, your standard, you know, cruciform hilt. Uh, with this sword, I'll kind of give you uh, kind of a description of all the um, kind of uh, dimensions of the basket itself as, as best I can. 
and, and you know, so it'll be you know kind of slightly unique with that with the guard section this time. So the exterior circumference from one end to the other is 15 inches round. And that's just from here to here. I didn't do a full circum, uh, circumference just because, you know, I'm kind of more focused on where your hand goes. Um, as far as the opening here, um, it is four and a half inches from end to end. And then the internal basket circumference, uh, you know, minus the liner is 13 inches. Now the total length of the basket from the pommel to the about the ram guard right here uh, is five and three quarters inches and then that internal um, length it's about five and a half inches so you know pretty similar there's not a lot of uh, you know kind of space uh, you know plenty of ample room you know for a hand even with the liner it has this nice you know woolen liner um, that does have a um, you know it's stitched in with a, a wire and that's how the basket is held on. You can kind of see it there maybe. Um, the little wires right here just right below where the you know basket meets the pommel. And it stayed in really good shape too. And you know it, it they're nice. It's it's uh you know it was uh you see that on historical models as well where they were you know it's not really uh it's kind of just for more for hand protection and just kind of comfortability of, of having the basket in. Um, you didn't see all have liners but you know, most of them, especially even the more modern, um, you know, dress military style basket hilts do have these liners. Um, as far as its material, it is a mild steel, again, blued uh, to keep up with the blackened finish. And as you can see, it has this nice design and cutouts, which was, you know, unique to the Highland uh, style basket hilt, which again, this guard would. Uh, you, know, you could call them the style or classify it as, you know, a unique Highland uh, basket hilt style. The handle or grip total length is four and a quarter inches. And its circumference at the base where it meets the upper basket portion is uh, three and a half inches. And that actually widens out to about three and three quarters inches. So. Unlike most, uh, you know, uh, medieval uh, style swords, it, it kind of tapers backwards. Now, the reason for that is, is because when you hold this sword, you kind of hold it more in a um, handshake or, or pistol grip. So you kind of have that extra uh, fattened portion on the back just to kind of help you ease into that grip style. Um, you know, and you see that a lot with, uh, you know, small swords. Uh, you know more intricate hilt swords of this time period just because of how they were using it in you know kind of the cut and thrust and how you'd use it with the basket um it's uh material it is a hardwood underneath and then it does have a really attractive full wrap of ray skin that has been blackened itself uh, with a black lacquer and then it has this uh, attractive silver wire spun in a helix to kind of finish off the aesthetic of the grip. The pommel's total length from the button to the base is an inch and a half long. And then the base circumference of the pommel is six inches. And as you can see, that sharply tapers up to the tang button. Now, I keep saying tang button, but this sword isn't actually uh, peened. Um, it's actually a, an external nut is the construction of this sword. Now I don't know if you can see but there is a small hole drilled into the top. Now that could be for you know one of two things. Uh, the first thing I think of is obviously um, you know for maintenance and things you can actually put a little key in there tighten it back up or loosen it if you want to take it apart um, you know, just so you don't have to worry about uh, mashing up or, or scraping the button or the finish. But the other thing more traditionally is that if you see, especially in the military dress basket hilts, uh, they will actually have a little tassel on them. So if you wanted to put a tassel on your, um, you know, basket hilt sword, you could, uh, you know, just fit it through that hole and, you know, add that aesthetic to it. Um, the pommel style itself 
is um, the type would be considered, it's pretty unique to, um, you know, basket hilts or just, you know, kind of intricate hilt swords of the time period anyway, is what was known as a pyramid um, style pommel or pyramid type pommel. And as you can see, it's, you know, its name pretty much describes the pommel itself as it has that triangular cross section that steeply tapers up into a pyramid shape. And finally, we'll look at the scabbard. Now, it's your typical uh, standard windlass scabbard, um, you know, hard leather core, and then the metal chape and throat. Now, this uh, throat and chape are steel, and they are black and blue to uh, blue to finish the uh, you know kind of the aesthetic of the sword being a battle cry line. Um, it is the harder variety of leather so it won't uh, kind of whip and flop on you. As far as, um, you know, just overall fit, you know, it doesn't fit it bad, but as usual with these all windless leather scabbards, it doesn't really have a good uh, friction fit, so the blade will slide out upside down. Um, but it does, it is, uh, you know, shaped pretty well to the blade. It doesn't want to rattle or shake or really, you know, it'll kind of move around, but that's a lot due to the um, you know, it'll kind of bounce a little due to the uh, weight of the basket, but still, I don't think you would really be bothered if you were hanging it on a belt that it would slide out on you. And again, it comes out fairly easy. The other unique thing to the Battle Cry line is, is that they all come with a um, frog uh, suspension system. And so I have that right here. So, um, you know, pretty unique and it actually works really well. Uh, you know, when you put it on your belt here, you know, it holds the sword nice and upright and, you know, doesn't really uh, slide around. You know, most frogs that are kind of come pre-made, they're kind of cheap. They don't hold the sword at the right angle. But, you know, when you put this one on a belt, it actually works. It actually works pretty well. So I'll put this uh, scabbard in it really quick and show you. But, yeah, it just slides in down here. Then it has this little frog button to attach it just to... Kind of give it extra security and then yeah it ain't going anywhere but even without that frog button it um you know it holds in pretty well so even without the frog button it's not going to slide out or anything it's got a nice friction fit to it and again when you're you know kind of holding it on a belt or baldric it's going to hold that sword in the upright position as you can see so you can draw out and not have you know any issue with the sword kind of flipping up on your down like some of those cheaper frogs do and again, this is just another addition to the Battle Cry line that's unique to them. Um, all of these Battle Cry swords do come with a frog, just like this. Um, and then they are, uh, you know, obviously of various widths, um, you know, due to the different sword um, types and styles that is in the Battle Cry line.
Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the cutting footage. So, this sword, compared to others featured on me reviews or just in my collection in general, is actually fairly new. You know, I've only owned it for about a year and a half. And I received the sword through trade on um, Sword Buyer's Guide Forum in the classifieds with another member. Now, you know, even though this sword's really, you know, pretty new in the collection, you know, I'd say I'd probably use it quite a bit. You know, I really like the sword, I really like the style. And just overall, it's just, you know, being a kind of that intricate hilt. It is my first intricate hilt style sword. And it's one that I've always been attracted to because I've just always kind of, I've been one of those people that too romanticizes the basket hilt and, you know, and just kind of love its overall design and, and just its, you know, practical functionality. You know, it's a, one of those swords that really, you know, encompasses a really elegant design, but also just has that, um, you know, kind of that brutality to it, the ferocity to its use, and just its, its design itself that just makes it a really formidable but attractive weapon. The sword itself has held up really well. You know, the basket hasn't shifted or bent. Um, you know, the pommel nut has, uh, you know, kept it tight. There hasn't been any loosening of the hilt or any need to retighten it. Um, the, uh, the grip stayed nice and intact, uh, you know, the, uh, the ray skin is really nice, the silver wire has it came up, same with the basket liner, you know, I've never really took it out and cleaned it or anything, but overall it's, you know, aside from a little dust, it hasn't really worn or faded or, or, you know, lost, you know, came undone at the stitching or anything like that. So, you know, overall it's really held up. The blade, you know, is just really nice. It's a nice, like I said, that high carbon steel has a nice temper, um, the edge is really well done, you know, it, it's your typical museum replica's edge which has a slight secondary bevel, but does its job, cuts really well, has stayed sharp, no nicks, no chips, um, as far as the finish, you know, I've cut quite a bit with this, you know, and I do light to medium cutting, but, you know, no light scratches, you know, it seems that the, uh, the, the finish uh, really kind of holds up the blade, same with like fingerprints and things. Um, you know, they don't really stick to the blade, you know, start kind of oxidizing like you, know, you see on more of a polished steel. So that's just the bluing doing its job, which is really nice. Um, you know, the other thing about this sword, you know, just with the bluing, um, you know, I tend to polish swords regularly about, you know, every, you know, twice to three times a month, you know, depending on how much I'm using them. And this sword, just to kind of test out that bluing um, in the finish, I kind of left it sitting for about five, six months. And yeah, again, no rusting, no kind of discoloration or anything. It's really held up really well. So it does have a really nice finish. The job is done really well. So if you like uh, a blued sword, you know, definitely this one is definitely one of those that, you know, they whatever they use to, to create the finish, they did a really great job. So, and it, and it works really well. So in regards to the Battle Cry line itself, you know, this is the first sword I've owned of the line, but, you know, being a sword enthusiast, you know, like others, you know, I'm sure you guys are watching, you know, if you're a sword enthusiast, you're online, you're doing a lot of window shopping, you're watching reviews like this, you know, reading reviews, things like that. So you kind of get a general idea of the swords. Now, you know, these swords aren't really unique to any other windless swords, uh, you know, as far as the Battle Cry line, I kind of look at them and it seems like it's a lot of older models, discontinued models that, um, you know, kind of get mixed and matched with various blades and, and hilt uh, types. For example, this sword, the basket on this sword is from an older basket hilt that they carried in their line in the early 2000s called the Culloden uh, basket hilt. And it had the same, you know, uh, basket design from Walter Allen, uh, but the blade was unique because it was more of a broader uh, triple fullered blade. Uh, and then it also had a different, more globular pommel. So as you can see here, this one has a unique uh, pyramid style pommel that I haven't seen on any basket hilts that they've carried, at least so far in my, you know, research of windless. And then the blade is pretty much like their um, current in the lineup. Uh, brass basket hilt sword. I'm pretty sure it's the same blade, and then of course it does have the uh, the you know the older discontinued Culloden basket, and that's what I look at with the other line too. It seems like it's just kind of a mix and match of different um, you know uh, 
swords and things, making new unique swords and then adding the blackened finish and the sharpened uh, section. So that is really nice on that end. Unfortunately, like it's becoming a trend with these re-reviews and I knew it was going to be that way when I started them. That's why they're kind of re-reviews. It's just kind of a fun way to look at older swords. Um, this sword is also discontinued. Um, surprisingly, it's not that old. I mean, the Battlecry line is only about two, three years old, but um, they, they discontinued this one really early. I don't know if it was just a limited run of, of doing a basket hilt in the line or if it didn't sell well, maybe. It seems like it sold well because, you know, it sold out. If it didn't sell, it'd probably still be on the market, you know, even if they weren't making it anymore. Um, but yeah, it just had a really short run. Um, you know, it kind of it kind of came later in the Battle Cry line. And then, you know, just, I want to say maybe five, six months ago, they had it, uh, MRL had a Museum Replicas had it on their um, last chance, and then they were gone. And most, uh, you know, third-party vendors don't have them anymore as well but if you really do like the sword and you want a sword like it again uh, what is kind of more of a staple in their line the brass basket hilted broadsword is pretty much the same sword again they got a few minor differences um, you know the uh, the brass basket hilt has a leather uh, wrapped grip rather than the ray skin um, it does have a different uh, style pommel and of course just I mean the overall Highland um, style of, of uh, basket is the same but the cutouts and, and just the aesthetics are a little different uh, comparatively. Same blade, pretty much same weight and balance so if you're interested in this sword and you like it uh, definitely check into that uh, brass basket hilt offered by Windless since it's still in stock and it is a um, you know pretty much the same sword just not all black. Um, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed the review. Uh, be sure to uh, like and subscribe. Um, as far as the next re-review, um, I'm actually planning on squeezing in two reviews uh, this next week. So hopefully it works out with my kind of timing and schedule. But the next sword re-review is actually going to be on kind of an older one, but a fun one. This one has some sentimental value to me. This is the Windless uh, Effigy Sword. Um, this was actually the first uh, functional European uh, sword that I that I purchased it, and I purchased it almost 10 years ago. So this is actually the first sword, first functional European sword anyway, in my collection. So I wanted to give a little uh, re-review of it. Of course, it's been long discontinued, but again, if you can find this one on the second-hand market, it's definitely one to look for. Um, it is really an amazing sword. And then as far as a... Uh, a new review, I will be doing a new review as I just picked this up over the weekend. This is a Windless Classic Hoplite Sword. And again, it is a uh, Xiphos style sword, uh, you know, ancient Greece uh, from about 500 BC is the design. So this is kind of my first um, kind of jump into uh, ancient period swords. So I'm going to have fun researching and, and getting a review out for you guys on this one because it is a really neat, handy little sword. Even if you're not really into, you know, Greece or the Greeks, it is still a, a really cool sword to, um, you know, kind of have just kind of as a short sword or, or even if you want to play fantasy, you have your functional sting. So again, I hope you guys enjoyed the review and we'll see you next time on Dynamo Sword Channel.